Hello, I'm Joe Del Santo, Professor of Astronomy at the College of DuPage, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's virtual STEMCon. I've got a fascinating topic I'd love to share with you today. One of the most recent, one of the most incredible discoveries that we've made in science, gravitational waves. To do that, I want to start off by giving you a little bit of background so you can fully understand and appreciate this whole thing. Three main questions we'll cover in this presentation. What are gravitational waves? How do we discover them? And why should we care about them? Let's begin with the first one, what are they? To answer that question, think about how we observe the universe, astronomers in particular. We use light, don't we? Our eyes take in so much information every day. And of course, astronomers have supplemented that with telescopes, some very sophisticated. You might know that light is essentially a form of energy. And it has different wavelengths, as you see in our images here. We can break light into longer, shorter wavelengths. But the point of this is, how do we use light, what we see in the universe, to explain the universe? This is obviously how science works. We'd like to understand the universe. So how do we do that? Well, there's many properties of the universe that we can observe and learn about with light. I won't take time to go into them now. Think about the sizes and distances and appearances of stars and galaxies and planets, so much information that we have gathered over the years. And yet now we have an entirely new way to do that, a new way to look at the universe. So one of our best early explanations of the universe was produced by this gentleman here, Isaac Newton. His classic theory of physics essentially was an experiential type of a theory. In other words, our everyday experience led him to develop various laws of nature. Now, in his mind, gravity was a force that he couldn't really explain what it was, but he knew that it acted in a certain way. It was an attractive force, and it varied with distance. So Newton came up with a very good theory for his time. You see in my diagram here showing two objects attracting each other, or you might think of the moon and the earth, or the earth and the sun. And this simple equation here describes to us how the universe works. So here's a good example of the observations that were made at that time that led us to a good explanation. However, by the late 19th century, there were some observations being made that were difficult to explain with Newton's idea. In other words, his theory turned out to be not quite so perfect. And so the time was ripe for a new theory. And you might know that this gentleman, Albert Einstein, came up with a better theory. We call it the general theory of relativity. Now, in Einstein's theory of relativity, gravity is not seen so much as this mysterious force, but rather, as you see in my simple diagram here, Gravity is seen to be a result of matter curving space. Kind of a very strange thought, isn't it? Sometimes we use this two-dimensional illustration here of the sun sitting on kind of a flat plane and the sun warps or curves the plane. It's a little harder to imagine that three-dimensionally, but think about how that would feel, how that we would experience that. Notice, for example, the Earth and other planets circle around the sun because the space is curved. An incoming comet, rather than going on a nice straight line, would also curve around the sun. In other words, matter curves space, but space tells matter how to move. Matter must follow the curvature. And again, think of the Earth orbiting the sun. One other very important part of Einstein's theory was this equation you see at the bottom here. E equals mc squared. Perhaps you've seen that or heard about that. It's essentially telling us that matter and energy are equivalent. They can essentially be considered very much the same thing in two different forms, and they can be equivalent. Okay, so that begins to give us now, as I said, a little background, a little context in which to appreciate this momentous discovery of gravitational waves. As we're going to see, it turns out that Einstein's general theory of relativity actually predicted gravitational waves. 
Here you see in our animation a first example of how we might envision this. We can't actually see it, of course, but in particular, two bodies orbiting around each other will generate waves of gravity. Now, to do that, they must lose energy. What type of energy do they lose? They lose energy from their orbit. In other words, they will slowly, gradually spiral closer together. And even though this takes a very long time, it is measurable. Notice in my graph here on the right, the sloping line is indicating that over many years, the amount of time it took for two stars to orbit each other was decreasing. So even though we weren't seeing the gravitational waves, we were seeing their effect. We were seeing the objects slowly, gradually getting closer together as they gave off the gravitational waves. Well, if they're getting closer together, you can imagine that sooner or later, they're going to merge. They're going to meet together. And here is perhaps our best opportunity then to find the gravitational waves, to somehow detect them. So let's go ahead and talk about that for a minute. How can we detect gravitational waves? Well, what we're really talking about here is if a wave of gravity moves through space, it distorts it or curves it. How could we measure the curvature distortion of space? Scientists have come up with what is called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And basically, it's composed of very, very long arms, very precisely de designed and built. And in these arms, we're going to shoot a laser beam. That laser beam is going to be split into two. And as you can see in this diagram here, go down these long paths, reflect off mirrors, and then come back to be recombined. Let me put this animation it's to start here as I describe this further. The idea is those two arms are identical in length to the very highest precision we can manage. But if a wave of gravity passes through them, they will change their length ever so slightly. This length or distance change is what we want to basically detect. So again, notice here as we shoot our laser, split into two beams, and then returns back and is reflected again to a screen. Notice as they exaggerate, of course, the length of the arms changing, we're gonna see now the different light waves as they travel are gonna recombine and the changing distance will be detectable. So here comes our, again, model light waves. And as they bounce one more time and recombine, we see them what we would call out of phase here, the, the yellow and the blue. But notice as the arms change length now, notice how those light waves may well be in phase. In other words, we will see a change on that screen. And again, this is greatly simplified, but you get the general idea here. Now this change is incredibly tiny. The distance change of the arms may be smaller than a typical atom. And yet we have the technology to detect the difference. So this was a very difficult technical challenge, required enormous energy, time, and money to construct two different detectors, as you see here, in the United States. And recently, another one's been added in Italy and others are being planned along the way. So these gravitational wave detectors are the way that we're able to see that. Okay, let's go back now and envision what this may look like as two very massive objects merge. Let's consider probably the ideal case here would be two black holes. Perhaps you know that black holes are very, very massive objects, relatively small. And as two of them would orbit each other, again, we would see gravitational waves being emitted, but these are very, very weak. It's when the gravitational waves are at their maximum, this occurs when the two objects merge, as you're gonna see here, a burst, a stronger signal, so to speak, of gravitational waves. So this is what scientists hope to capture. This would be our opportunity to actually detect these extremely weak gravitational waves. Well, late summer 2015 in September was the first direct observation. What an exciting time that was for the team. In less than one second, two black holes merged 
and they converted an enormous amount of energy, or rather matter, into energy. You can see my number here, 10 to the 49th watts. Imagine writing that number out with 49 zeros. That's the equivalent of taking the mass of our sun three times that amount and changing that entirely into energy. One of the most energetic events we've ever detected. And you can see here the graph showing the actual detection and the visualization down towards the bottom. Since that time, there have been over 50 other such detections. So the science is beginning to mature somewhat. We're beginning to get a little greater number of them that we can study and begin to see various masses of objects such as black holes or even other objects such as neutron stars causing these gravitational waves. So it's a very exciting time. It's very early in the study of gravitational waves, but scientists are very excited after many years of hard work to actually be able to do so now. Another huge step forward occurred in August of 2017 when an event was detected that we now think was two neutron stars merging. But amazingly, this event also produced a burst of light that was not detectable at the earlier events. Why is this significant? Well, this gives us the opportunity to do what is now being called multi-messenger astronomy. In other words, we can detect the gravitational waves, but we can also detect light of various wavelengths, as you see here, visible light, X-ray, ultraviolet, infrared. This gives scientists two complementary, very powerful ways to study these events. This first event became known as a kilonova. This was a anticipated event, but a very rare event. And so scientists were ready. When the first signals were received, numerous scientists throughout the Earth were notified immediately, and many telescopes were then swung towards this event to observe it, again, in many different wavelengths of light and in gravitational waves. Would you like to see what that looks like? This, of course, is just an artist's impression, but it will give you quite a sense of the violence of this merger. Here you see the two neutron stars spiraling closer. When they collide, tremendous energy is released. Pretty dramatic. Uh animation, wouldn't you say, showing us what that might have looked like. And I have to tell you, this was huge in another aspect. Astronomers have a very good understanding of stars. We know much about their lives, how they're born, how they die. But there, of course, are some things we need to study further. Well, this event allowed us to do that. This event allowed us to learn more about the deaths of stars. And as a result, has greatly added to our knowledge. So. Pretty cool stuff, wouldn't you say? But what does it all mean for you and me, for the average person? We're probably not going to get involved in this. We might be interested to follow it. Why is this even important? Well, to answer that, let me make, finish with a few comments here about why we do science. Number one, humans simply want to understand the universe. It's as simple as that. We've done science now for many centuries. Of course, number two, there are many practical benefits. And to do that, I sometimes use this illustration with my students of electricity. Go back about 200 years to the early 19th century. Electricity was not understood very well at all. There were a few scientists experimenting with it. Did not affect most people's lives. But little did anyone know the incredible, <laughs> incredible effects it would eventually have. No one could anticipate where it would lead, as you see in my images at the bottom here, think about it. It first resulted in a practical sense, at least, the invention of the light bulb. After scientists began to understand it better, laws were developed. 
Once the light bulb was invented, that led to further advances in technology, something called a radio. At that time, it was remarkable to think that one person could speak into a device and another could hear his voice many miles away. It was a remarkable achievement at the time, a wireless communication method. Well, you know the story as the decades went on in the 20th century, of course, television then was developed from that earlier technology. That also led to the development of computers, not only in industry, but in everyone's home. And today, of course, we all carry around with us a computer, our cell phones, that's far more powerful than nearly every computer in existence a few decades ago. And ultimately, this has led now to the incredible internet that we all love to use so very much, don't we? How much information can be shared earthwide? All of this goes back to the basic research that began almost 200 years ago into electricity. And so my point is, where will the discovery of gravitational waves lead? Well, we don't know, but that's kind of the point. We don't know what advances there may well be. Had you asked someone 200 years ago, could they possibly envision what we have today? No. So it would sure be interesting to stick around for 200 more years, wouldn't it? And see where this leads us. So this is why I always like to say, pure research does matter. We do want to invest in learning about and understanding our universe. Well, again, quite an interesting topic, I think. And again, you can see that in the short and long term, there are certainly benefits to this kind of thing. Hope you've enjoyed our brief discussion here of gravitational waves. I'd like to invite you to look me up on YouTube sometimes. I have a number of presentations out there in astronomy that you might enjoy. But for now, I'd like to thank you for visiting this year's virtual STEMCon.